Okay, so tonight I am about to say something that you, I would guess, never have heard said in a pulpit before. Jesus wants you to do something. What he wants you to do is stop tithing. Jesus wants you to stop tithing. Now, when I make a statement like that, people's mouths drop open. They don't understand. Their minds are blown. How can anyone say that? I understand the words that he said, but I've never heard them arranged in a sentence like that before. What is he talking about? Now, the reason that is, is because what people did not hear me say what I said, they heard something altogether different. What the people heard me say is Jesus wants you to stop giving. Stop giving money to church. I said Jesus wants you to stop tithing, and what they hear is that guy doesn't think you should give money to church. And that's not at all what I said. The reason that is, the reason people misunderstand me when I say Jesus wants you to stop tithing, and they think I'm saying Jesus wants you to stop giving, is because tithing is the only way they know how to give. They don't know how to give money to church unless it's mandatory and forced, like a tithe. So I know I start with a, um, a wild statement for somebody to say in a pulpit, Jesus wants you to stop tithing, but I'm going to set about to prove that tonight and whether you, at the end, agree with me or you disagree with me, whether you think I'm right, whether you think I'm nuts, uh, one thing I think you can understand is I'm at least being intellectually honest in my arguments. And the reason that is is because I'm trying to get a small church going. I need money for that. Um, so I would love to have lots more money than I have. Uh, so it would be advantageous for me personally, for the goals that I'm trying to do with this assembly, to teach a tithe, but I do not. I teach giving. So, like I said, agree or disagree, at least I'm being honest. Uh, and some of you know the truth of this already. Uh, some of you may not have heard it before. Some, this may be old hat, but <clears throat> what I want to do this week is not only prove why Jesus wants you to stop tithing, or prove that Jesus wants you to stop tithing. I also want to talk about the why and answer the question, why are some people in your Bible commanded to tithe and tithe multiple times, not just one 10%, but multiple percentages, and why are some people commanded not to tithe in your Bible? And if you are honest and rightly divide your Bible, you can see that, yes, uh, some people in your Bible are commanded not to to tithe. And uh, I was thinking, I was out in Indiana talking to a pastor, and he was telling me a story about a man who left his church. And the man was upset because the pastor would not accept his tithe check. He wouldn't let the man tithe because he knew that Jesus wants us now, today in the dispensation of God's grace, not to tithe, but to give. And the man got upset and left the church because the pastor wouldn't let him tithe. And I just thought, that's wild. What pastor in the world would you ever hear of refuse a, a tithe check? Uh, you'd think they'd just wink and take it, but this man was, was firmly persuaded. But tithes support a big business, and that's the church business. Billions of dollars a year go into churches in America to keep the, uh, the machine going. And most of the money that comes into churches is not on missionary work, gospel activities, seeing souls saved, saints edified. Most of the money that comes in is sent back into the machine to perpetuate the machine, you know, to pay people's salaries. pay pastor's salaries, to, to buy 401ks, to, to perpetuate programs in the building. You know, last year's Christmas special was great. This year we're going to make it even better. That's where most of the money in churches go to. And churches separate people from their money very efficiently. And they use two methods.
Number one is greed. I'm sure you've seen the folks on TBN talking about if you just send in your seed check of $100, why God's going to open up the floodgates of heaven and give you thousands of dollars in return as a blessing for that. So that's one motivation. If I give $10, I'll get back 100 That is base, fleshy greed. That's all that is. It's not spirituality. It's not I'm holier than thou. It's you're giving to get. You're giving out of a greed motivation. The second one is guilt. And I see people beat up with this all the time. Their preachers take them to Malachi 3 and accuse them of bringing a curse on their church or a curse on their household because they are not tithing according to the Old Testament law. And so they beat you up with a guilt trip. Why are you sick? Why is your wife struggling? Why did you lose your job? Why? It's because you held back part of the 10% that you owe God. And that's what's going on. So two motivations, greed and guilt, are what motivate givers. Now, just tithes in America, like I said, reach into the billions of dollars. This isn't the, the gifts where somebody will donate a large sum for this or that or donate their house to, to a church. But it's funny, most churches, you're not allowed to do anything before you become a member in their assembly. And whatever they require to, to make you a member, whether it be baptism or you have to sign their statement of faith or you have to go through a class, you're not allowed to do anything. You're not allowed to be a janitor. You're not allowed to, to teach Sunday school until you do all that. But the one thing that you're allowed to do day one when you walk in the door, anybody and everybody can do is put money in the plate, is give money. So... That should be telling to a lot of folks on <clears throat> uh, what a lot of churches' motivation is. They need to get money. And when I was a boy, I grew up in the Baptist denomination, and tithing was taught to me. And it was almost presented as it's a timeless activity. It's from the front of your Bible to the back of your Bible. It's always been done that way. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and then he created tithing was the way it was, it was taught to me. It was just something that you did. And I think it's interesting um, that me being a guy standing up here saying, Jesus wants you to stop tithing. People think maybe partly because I'm young or partly because they've never heard such a crazy thing like that before, that I'm teaching some new wind of doctrine. Because as we know, tithing's been from ages uh, and generations before. But here's something what most people don't know is tithing was not taught in America on a regular basis. Everybody needs to peel off 10% of your paycheck every time you come into the door. It was not taught in this country until the late 19th century. And the reason that was is up until that time, the town funded the church. It's like, we have a library, we have a police station. How did that get paid for? Well, everybody in the town pays a little bit of tax and it gets paid for. Uh, that's how churches were funded until the late 19th century. Now, when our country started changing and that revenue stream dried up, what do the preachers got to do? We got to figure out a way to get some money coming in here. We got to eat too. So they start teaching tithing. And that's when that became popularized. And a lot of times, like I said, in t Titus 1.9, we get some definition on why somebody would teach a tithe. And some people do teach tithing out of a sincere heart. They think it's what we're supposed to be doing, and they think that it's right, and they teach it to their people. Most, of the, most folks, though, teach tithing as a way to bring in regular revenue. If I know I'm getting 10% from these 100 people every week, I know what to plan on, I can plan my expenses, that's why they do it, and to, to get money for themselves. But some people, like I said, do, are sincere about it. They're wrong because Jesus wants you to stop tithing, as we'll see tonight, but they are sincere. So to those two or three gentlemen out there in the world, I will apologize. But Titus 1.9, Paul is instructing Timothy, and he says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, people saying things 
to gain something, money, position, power. People saying things to gain say. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. And what's every church in town think they are? They think there's some way the circumcision, whether they're spiritual Israel or replacement Israel or covenant new grafted in people to Israel. Everybody thinks they're Israel. So here we have an idea on why you see the tithe taught a lot is people are saying things to get money and they think they're Israel. They don't understand about the church, the body of Christ, the new creature. What does Paul say about these people whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, dirty money, filthy money, money got by lying or deception or error. And that's what the tithe is today as it's taught in most churches. The word tithe is not complicated at all. The word tithe just means a tenth part of something. A tenth part of anything, but appropriately the tenth part of the increase annually arising from the profits of land or stock. Now, I said at the outset that Jesus wants you to stop tithing. A tithe is not giving. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is mandatory. It is, in all essence, a tax. It's not optional. If God commands somebody to give a tithe, it's not if your heart feels like it, give a tithe. No, if God commanded a person to give a tithe, they must give it. It's like if you said to the IRS, I don't feel like paying my income taxes this year. The Lord hasn't laid that on my heart to do that. What will happen is you will end up in jail because a tax like a tithe is not optional. Tithing is biblical. I love my preacher. He just preaches from the Bible every week. Uh, the devil quotes a lot of Bible in the Bible. Uh, so being biblical is not good enough. But tithing is definitely biblical. Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed ye? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation, that nation being the nation Israel, under its Old Testament, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. So you see God calling people who did not tithe robbers. That means it's mandatory. It is not optional. The tithe was required under the law of Moses. Required, Leviticus 27.30, the first time we see the word tithe show up in the Bible, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Notice it wasn't cash there. It wasn't um, cash payments. It's tithes of the land, seed of the land, fruit of the tree. Um, and there are, like I said, more than one tithe in the Old Testament law. This one's often referred to as the Levitical tithe. Numbers 18.20, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, whether thou shalt have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. Verse 21, And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth uh, in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you see this tribe of Levi, they don't get an inheritance of the land, but they get a tenth part from all the other tribes given to them as they serve as priests. And isn't that what most preachers today will say? I'm, I'm your priest now, and I serve you uh, for God, and you owe me a tenth part of your paycheck now. This is where I learned this from. And isn't this our temple that we came to worship in today? And I am the priest and bring me your tenth part. But here's something you'll never hear taught about tithing, uh, whether Old Testament or new. Not everyone in Israel, even under the Old Testament, was required to tithe. Leviticus 2730 
We just read it, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. What if you don't own any land or trees or seeds or have any profit from that to bring in? What do you tithe off of? You have nothing to tithe, so you are not obligated to tithe something you don't have. You're supposed to give a tenth part. I don't have any parts. You can't give a tenth part of zero. So even under the Old Testament law, not everybody is required to tithe. And I'm standing up here saying, Jesus wants you to stop tithing. And here, for the average person, well, I just heard him read three Bible verses that talked about tithing. You must have to be tithing if you're going to follow the Bible. Well, number one, you can't follow the whole Bible uh, because a lot of it opposes has opposite instructions. If you look at Joel 3.10 and Micah 4.3, they have opposite instructions on what you should do with your swords and plowshares. One verse says, turn your plowshares into swords. The other verse says, turn your swords into plowshares. You can't do both at the same time. So you, just finding it somewhere in the Bible is not good enough. And... <clears throat> Everybody likes to say 10% is good enough for Jesus. It ought to be enough for Uncle Sam. Uh, but 10% was most definitely not enough for Jesus under the Old Testament law. There was another 10% tithe in addition to the tithe they brought to the Levites that they had to pay on. The, we'll call this the feast tithe. Israelites had to come to have a feast in Deuteronomy 12.1. These are the statutes and judgments which he shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that she live upon the earth. That does not sound optional. It sounds required. But unto, verse 5, unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. So the Lord's going to name the place. You need to show up. Verse 6, and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and land and vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. And there ye shall eat before the Lord and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand to, ye and your households, and on and on and on. So we've got the 10% to the Levites. Now we've got a 10% tithe for the festival for God's, uh, one of God's holy days. And God, and when he instituted the Jewish religion, he instituted the only liturgical calendar that he's ever approved. That was the Jewish Sabbaths and holy days and feast days. And one of them, you get to bring a 10% tithe to, uh, to enjoy during that feast. And in um, Deuteronomy 14, you know, you've got this herdsman out in the, in the hinder parts of Israel, and he had 500 new cows this year. Does he really want to drag 50 cows hundreds of miles down to Jerusalem to this festival? Well, the Lord made provision for that. In Deuteronomy 14, he's allowed to turn it into money. He's allowed to sell the stuff, turn it into money, and bring it to the feast. And at that place, here's the tithe that nobody will ever teach from a pulpit. You get to spend it, Deuteronomy 14, 26, on whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, <laughs> whether it be for oxen or for sheep or for wine or strong drink, and on and on and on. So now we've got the 10% tithe for the party. The third tithe under the Old Testament law, a lot of people will call it the poor tithe, the tithe to take care of the poor people. That's... In uh, once every three years, you have a 10% tithe, and this tithe is also not optional. Deuteronomy 26, 12, when thou, shalt, when thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase, the third year, which is the year of tithing, and hath given it to the Levite, to the stranger, the fatherless, to the widow, so it can go to anybody, whoever's poor, whoever's needy that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house and also have given them unto the Levite and unto the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow. And listen to this. I said tithe is not an option. 
Listen to what it says here. According to all thy commandments, which thou hast commanded me, I have not transgressed thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. So the man in the verse says, Lord, I've kept all of your commandments. I've done everything that you've commanded me. It's not optional. Compare that. Last half of verse 13, Deuteronomy 26, 13. To 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Jesus, I said, wants you to stop tithing. Because Jesus told us this. Us being not Old Testament Israel, not New Testament Israel, but members of the church, the body of Christ, who are alive and serving the Lord today in this, the dispensation of God's grace. He says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart... We just read the verses about it's commanded, you can't, you, you have to do it, commandments, I've commanded me. And now Christ is saying, you're giving, you decide? That's not the same thing. It's not the tenth, every third year, you must break. As your own heart, you get to decide what you give and whom you give it to and how much and where. It's completely different, completely opposite of the mandated tithing of Israel's Old Testament. Every man according as he purposeth, purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. That is the opposite of tithing. Tithing is necessity. It's commanded. You have to do it. God the Lord Jesus Christ, I said he wants you to stop tithing because he specifically prohibits you from tithing in 2 Corinthians 9-7. A tithe is a necessity. And Christ Jesus tells us our giving is not to be of necessity. And that's how I get to the statement at the beginning of the outset tonight. Jesus wants you to stop tithing. So we've had another sword and plowshare moment. You cannot do both. You cannot be following required, mandated, specific tithes from the Bible according to specific amounts and whatever you decide in your heart and make sure it's not of necessity. You can't do both. We've got a sword plowshare moment. So what do you do? Oh, I just follow the whole Bible. No, you don't. You absolutely do not. People who say they are following Christ after the red letters have not read the red letters because they most definitely are not keeping the instructions he commanded in the red letters. So I make a bodacious statement like this that nobody's ever heard, and somebody says, hey, I think I've never heard that before, so that must be wrong. That's good logic. Um, but I think you're just uh, maybe taking Paul out of context, and um, you know, we should look to the red letters for, for what we should do, because that's Jesus. I mean, you can't be higher than Jesus. Um, well, the Apostle Paul ran into a little bit of that during his ministry here on the planet. And he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are optional. Get trumped by the red letters? No, that's not what he says. He says, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 9.7. So you know what we should do with 2 Corinthians 9.7? We should believe it. We should believe what it says and take it at its face value. That's a commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am prohibited from tithing. So now we've got Bible that prescribes and commands the tithe, and we've got Bible that prohibits the tithe. Perhaps we should look to the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry, like somebody who would oppose this doctrine would tell you to do, let's see what Jesus said in his red letters. Matthew 19, 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Verse 20, uh, Christ tells him to keep the commandments. And verse 20, 
Uh, the young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto them, If thou wilt be perfect, thou shalt tithe one hundred percent. That's not what the verse says. That was my paraphrase. If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. Not a 10%, not a 20%, not a 33 and a third percent, a 100% tithe. Now, people like to tell stories about this passage because they can't handle the doctrinal construct and what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't know that it's still Old Testament and you can't have a New Testament without the death of the testator. People don't know that, so they like to tell stories about, well, Jesus was just testing him. He was seeing if he loved him. I go by the text. Jesus, I'm going to say, was able to say what he meant to say. And he told the man to sell all of his stuff. And the man, and he says, thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And we all know what the young man did. He walked away sorry because he loved all of his stuff. The reason the Lord Jesus Christ told him to get rid of all his stuff, you find the answer five chapters later in Matthew 24. Matthew 19, Matthew 24, Jesus is preaching doctrine to people who are about to enter the tribulation where you can't have any stuff because you can't buy or sell. You're going to have to flee into the wilderness. The Lord's going to have to feed you out there and take care of you and protect you from your enemies. So, yes, Jesus meant to say exactly what he said to the rich man. Sell all your stuff and follow me. Oh, I don't think so, Steve. I've never heard anybody say that. I don't know what you're talking about, this dispensation. What? Now you're saying something about tribulation? I don't think he was talking literally. Well, the church in <laughs> Acts 2, they sure thought Jesus Christ's instructions were literal. And I know that because I can read Acts 2. Acts 2, 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common and did exactly what Jesus said to do in Matthew 19. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. They had a commune. <laughs> And they, continuing daily and with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So those folks thought Jesus was talking literally, and they did it. And we see what happens when somebody decides to, say, give a 90% tithe instead of a 100% tithe. You see that in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. The Holy Ghost kills them because they blasphemed the Holy Ghost. They sinned willfully. Um, after they were enlightened according to Israel's New Testament doctrine. Uh, so, not to, not to get into all that tonight, but what I'm trying to say is going to Jesus in the red letters doesn't help you any. You go from tenths and multiple tenths to now 100%. So Jesus wanted another 90. But we know from Matthew 15, 24 and Romans 15, 8, that Jesus in his earthly ministry to the nation Israel was to the nation Israel to confirm the promises made to the fathers. It doesn't have anything to do with us, the church, the body of Christ. So doctrinally, and let me make another shocking statement as well as Jesus wants you to stop tithing, Jesus didn't have anything to say to you or I today in his red letters. He was talking to his lost sheep of Israel. And if you're saved today, you're not a member of Israel. You're a member of the church, the body of Christ, in which there is no such thing as circumcision or uncircumcision. We are all members one of another, but nobody knows that either. <clears throat> but Jesus did tell us, he didn't have anything to say to me in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, doctrinally. But he did tell me in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that I am prohibited from tithing. Why is the question. Before we get into that, why would God command certain people to tithe in the Bible? Why are some people told, no way not to, but some people are? Well, we know that Israel was God's nation. God created the nation Israel, and he started the Old Testament covenant right about Exodus 19. If you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant in Exodus 19.5, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. 
and ye shall be a kingdom of priests and holy nation. So we've got a literal nation of people that are going to literally occupy land on this planet and serve God. It's not about going to heavenly places or going to heaven or having spiritual blessings in heavenly places like we're promised. It's about being a people on this earth. And these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So we've got a nation of people that was ordained of God, occupying land, and to be a kingdom of God on this planet. And you've also got these people under a performance covenant. It's not by grace are ye saved through faith, as we hear today. It's performance. And you see what happens when you're in a covenant relationship with God and you break that covenant. We saw that in Malachi 3. God calls you robbers and curses you. That's an if-then covenant performance relationship. That is not how we come to God as a member of the body of Christ. Even in Israel's New Testament, they have to endure to the end of their tribulation. Hebrews 10.26, If you sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but looking forward to judgment and fiery indignation. That's the relationship that these people have to God. So Jesus, the word made flesh, gave different instructions to different people in different dispensations. That's a fact. If you're able to be honest and read your Bible, believe it literally, believing the words on the page, not changing them to suit your denomination's doctrine, but just reading and believing, you see that God in sundry times in diverse manners spake as Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says. God gave different instructions to different people. Nobody on this planet today is commanded to build an ark. Why? I follow the whole Bible. Where's your boat? Where's your garden you walk around in naked? I follow the whole Bible. But that wasn't for them. This is for us. Oh, so you're dispensational. How come you folks who follow Acts 2, haven't sold all your stuff. Well, that was for them. No, you're dispensational then. That's how you understand the Bible. That's the key to understanding your Bible. Now, let's have some more opposing Bible here. Under grace, under the doctrine which God has in operation today on this planet, 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That sounds pretty bad. So God commands me to provide for my own house. And if I don't do that, I've denied the faith and I'm worse than an infidel. That's pretty simple to understand. That's exactly opposite of what Jesus, in the red letters, taught in Matthew 19. Jesus taught people to forsake their own house. Matthew 19, 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake according to what we just read, is worse than an infidel, right? What does Jesus say? If you've forsaken all that, you shall receive it a hundredfold and shall inherit eternal life. Those are opposite instructions. Same Lord Jesus Christ operating two different programs, one where he tells you to provide for your own house, the other one he says, forsake it all and follow me. They're opposite instructions. You cannot reconcile them. If you do, you're lying to yourself or possibly others. Well, what people don't understand is the beginning of the Gospels, Christ Jesus is presenting kingdom doctrine to his prophetic people Israel. Matthew 5, you read all about it. It's what life will be like in the kingdom. When you start to get to the end of the book, like Matthew 24, Christ is talking about tribulation doctrine for the nation Israel. They have to endure the time of Jacob's trouble before they go into their kingdom. And meanwhile, every church in town doesn't know that, and they're trying to make these words somehow apply to us today, living in America in 2015. And they completely ignore grace and miss that, because why? We've got to keep you tithing. We've got to keep that money rolling in. We won't dare teach 2 Corinthians 9-7.
But our doctrine is Jesus wants us to stop tithing. Why? Reason number one. Romans 6.14. Ye are not under the law. Ye are under grace. The tithe is law. Romans 6.14. You're not under that. So if 2 Corinthians 9.7 wasn't good enough for you, how about Romans 6.14? Secondly... Word here. You are not under a covenant relationship with God. Well, I just drove past the church and it said new covenant such and so. They don't understand. They're wrong. You did not come to God. If you are saved today, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection as full payment for your sins with a period at the end of it, it's not trust Christ and I'm going to get baptized and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do If you've trusted Christ's payment alone, as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Ephesians 1, 13 state, if you're saved, you do not come to God by a covenant. And I know that because I have in God's word, Ephesians 2, 12, Ephesians 2.12, talking about how we were before we were saved, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Sounds like a pretty sad state. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by circumcision, joining up with Israel's covenants, following Israel's laws, no, how are we made nigh? By the blood of Christ. For he is our peace and hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, abolished, look what else he abolished, the law of commandments contained in ordinances like the tithes and the feast days and all that he's abolished. And lots of people say, well, yeah, well, well, grace came, and then now, now they add Gentiles to Israel. No. Look at, the ver look at what the verse says. For to make in himself of twain one new man. Not adding Gentiles to Israel, but something completely different. Adding both into a new creature. New creature means it had not existed before. So I'm sorry, Billy Graham is wrong when he says everybody in the Old Testament was looking forward to the cross. This is out of circumcision, uncircumcision, out of twain, one new man. It's part of the mystery of Christ that nobody knows about. So that's another reason you are not under a tithe and Jesus wants you to stop tithing is you don't have a covenant relationship with God. Another reason... can't be cursed. Malachi 3 says, if you don't tithe, you're going to be cursed. The Lord Jesus Christ would have you to know today that you cannot be cursed if you're saved and a member of the church, the body of Christ. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So, if you think you can be cursed by God for not following Israel's Old Testament tithe instructions, you're either ignorant or you may have been deceived. You may have a charlatan in your pulpit lying to you, trying to rip nails out of Calvary's cross and what Christ did for you in order to get his hand in your pocket and get money. That's not something I want to ever stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be responsible for. Hey, uh, Steve, how come you didn't teach... Um, Teach them that I redeemed them from all those curses. And you taught them that they could be cursed for not giving you money. Well, because I needed money, Lord. What do you think he's going to have to say about that? But people do it every day. I'm complete in Christ, according to Colossians 2.10. What did the rich young man say? What lack I yet? And Jesus told him what he lacked. If I'm saved today, Christ tells me I'm complete. I don't lack anything. 
My kingdom and blessings are not earthly. I'm not headed for a kingdom on earth. My home isn't on earth anymore. That's why I'm called an ambassador. I don't live here. I am here doing a job in a place that I don't live, and I'm not planning on staying here, and this is not where my inheritance is, and this is not where I'm going to end up for eternity. I'm going to heavenly places. While I'm alive, I'm here doing a job. He's freely given me, according to Ephesians 1.3, my heavenly kingdom and blessings. Another reason, if you're not going to tithe... Another reason you may understand that Jesus wants you to stop tithing, that reason may be because you've become a little bit stronger in the faith. Galatians 4 9, we know the Galatian problem. They started going back under Israel's laws. But now, Galatians 4 9, after that, ye have known God, or rather are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? So Paul compares your standing as a member of the church, the body of Christ, to going back under these laws and tithes. He calls it weak and beggarly. So if you're strong in the faith, you may know that Jesus wants you to stop tithing. And folks who hear this, and folks who hear me say this, get upset. They get mad. They think I'm wrong. Like I said, they've never heard anything like this, so it must be wrong which is, like I said, ridiculous logic. But they'll say, yeah, we don't, we don't have the, Levitic, the Levites, and we don't have the priests in the temple, and we're not killing animals, but uh, I'm your pastor, and I'm your priest now, and this church is our holy temple. And that's replaced that, so you think you don't have to give 10%. Uh, yours is trying to rob God. A person making that statement, trying to make himself a priest, trying to put himself between you and your head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, is ignorant. 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us there are no priests for us as members of the body of Christ. What's a priest's job? To mediate between God and men, right? Our apostle tells us in 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So if your preacher is trying to add himself as number two, he's in violation of that verse. Secondly, trying to make the church building somehow holy or sacred ground is showing yourself to be ignorant of a truth that God has instilled in us as members of the church of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God? He's talking about people in physical bodies. He's not talking about some giant edifice or some cathedral. He says, don't you know that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? You're the temple. You don't have a temple to bring a tithe to. Our ministry is not in conquering lands and building giant cathedrals for Jesus. Our ministry is people, hearts, and minds, seeing souls saved and saints edified. It's not about conquering Ohio for Jesus. We're going to leave here. We need to take as many people with us. That's our job. But finally, all these reasons we see why Jesus wants you to stop tithing. He commanded you to. He prohibited it in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And he tells you in Galatians 5, 1, to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. If he wants you to stand in liberty and be free, he is not going to allow you to tithe. So why are you tithing? Don't ever let somebody tell you and limit you to 10%. You are free to give much more than 10% of your money to Christ today. There's no prescription against that. But, you know, you show these verses to people. And it's a pretty compelling case if you just believe your Bible and read the words that it has to say. 
and that scares people. So they take drastic measures to try to keep you tithing. They take you back to Genesis 14 and talk about Melchizedek. Why does that accomplish anything for him? Well, I just read all these verses that you're not under the law. What if I can find a tithe before the law? Then I can make you tithe some more. So they go back to Genesis 14. After Abraham goes and saves the day in a battle and brings back the good guys, where Abraham is blessed by a priest called Melchizedek. And after Abram receives the blessing, he gives a tenth of all the spoils of warfare to this Melchizedek guy. And from that, pastors who can't argue this will say, see, Abraham did it. You think you're better than Abraham? And the logic behind that is so thin. You find an event that happened one time in all of history by a very special man in your Bible, Abraham. And from that, you're going to extrapolate, I need 10% of every one of your paychecks in perpetuity. That's how desperate they are to keep you from the liberty that Christ has placed us in. They're scared for the people to be in liberty because bondage is predictable. I've got them all in bondage. I know I'm going to get $52.87 from him, $74.61 from him. It's easier for the administration. So they're scared to let you be at liberty because grace does something very interesting. Grace exposes what a person actually is. When you set them free, Brother Bob's giving may go from $50 to $100. Meanwhile, the lady in the back's giving goes from $150 down to zero because now she doesn't want to give anymore because she knows she doesn't have to. So it exposes people's hearts. But why do we give? And how do we give knowing that Jesus wants us to stop tithing? What's our motivation? We are not motivated by greed or guilt. It's not about us getting something, and it's not about us being afraid of losing something. Our giving starts with 1 Thessalonians 5.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything, give thanks. Giving is part of the everything. So in everything, in my giving, should be giving thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What's God's will for my life? Start with thanksgiving. So we don't give because we're trying to get God to do something for us or we're afraid God's going to punish us. We give money to support ministry as a part of thanksgiving for what God has already done for us. We were headed for hell. The Lord intervened with the gospel, saved our souls, and we're thankful about that. And we want to support other people having the same blessings that we now have with our money. We want to buy gospel tracts. We want to buy radio time, TV time, whatever it is. We give to see the gospel perpetuated. 1 Timothy 2.3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So we know we're thankful, we know what God's will is for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Being thankful, knowing what God's will is, we know these things and we identify people or ministries or uh, programs that are going to try to accomplish that goal. Wow, that church out there, they're giving out gospel tracts by the thousand. They've got the gospel correct, they're preaching the word of God rightly divided. I'm going to put some of my money towards them because I know that's what God wants done. It's not about if I don't give them money, God's going to beat up on me. Or if I give them some of my money, God's going to give all these blessings to me. It's nothing about that. It's nothing about us. It's not about our life. It's about Christ's goals and Christ's plans. And what happens, we see that, and we purpose in our heart, 
just like 2 Corinthians 9, 7, not out of necessity, not grudgingly, but because we want to, and we give cheerfully as 2 Corinthians 9, 7. How can we do it cheerfully? Number one, it's not a tax. It's not required. It's not mandated. But I'm thankful for what God has done to me. I want to see that happen for other people. So here's some money. I'm cheerfully doing this. That's how we give under grace. Putting yourself under a tithe is so weak and beggarly. And Jesus wants us to stop tithing. Those of us who understand what liberty there is in Christ, our standing in state with Christ Jesus, when you understand the liberty, you also understand the responsibility that's placed on us. Because it's not God will get it done through his puppet master ways. It's no, you understand I'm responsible to see God's will done today. I'm the ambassador. I'm the one who needs to be supporting these kinds of things with my time, with my efforts, with my money. Because nobody else is going to do it if I don't. So liberty, people think, oh, I'm at liberty. I'm just going to go do whatever I want to do. No, it's a weight of responsibility that comes down on us that we know we've been given grace and we need to minister grace. And we need to pay to see that it gets done. Another reason that giving is necessary under grace is it's necessary. Bills need paid. Lights, gas, heat, tracks need bought, cameras need bought, internet bandwidth. All that stuff costs money. And it needs to be paid for. So why do we give? Because you must. You can't have a church building or a church space unless somebody pays for it. And Paul talked about this in Philippians 4.13. Everybody knows Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And he tells the Philippians, Now, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Paul would be a terrible televangelist. I mean, you see that? He didn't come to the churches and say, Hey, here's how much money you're going to give. Here's my seat. He waited for them to ask him about giving and receiving. So he'd be terrible on TBN. But look at what the uh, Philippians did. Even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Paul needed stuff. He was in trouble a lot of times. He was uh, being chased down and hunted and tried to kill a lot of times. So giving is necessary. So we give because we're thankful. We give because we're supporting God's will on this planet. And we give because it's necessary. It's not, like I said, our grace giving, if you're a responsible, mature saint in Christ who understands Jesus wants you to stop tithing, your giving is not about you leveraging some kind of a blessing from heaven or avoiding a curse. It's about us, members one of another, in Christ, supporting each other, providing what is necessary to see God's will done and God's gospel of the grace of God spread on planet Earth. So that is why Jesus wants you to stop tithing, learn grace, and start giving.